Welcome back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Daphina McMillan. I am the Director of Communications and Conferences at the TCG. How are y'all? <laughs> it's been such a joy over these past few days to meet with old conference friends and meet new ones. I'm also, it's a joy to work with such an amazing, amazing team at TCG. I would be remiss if I didn't thank all the staff members here who go above and beyond every day, who give their all and more. They give their all because they truly care and that inspires me. I have to especially give a big shout out to our conference core team. Um, Devin Berkshire, Gus Schulenberg, Annabelle Guevara, and our wonderful interns, Natalie and Matt. Yay! <laughs> I wouldn't be standing here without all of them, their support and their generosity. As we've been going through the archives of past conferences, there are so many stories worth sharing, and they're all about these moments of connection and generosity. At a conference in the early 90s, Culture Clash, an ensemble of brilliant Chicano artists performed. The legend has it that after their performance, Gordon Davidson of the Mark Taper Forum dropped to his knees and bowed down before them. After that, Culture Clash went on to do multiple performances at the Taper and across the country. Tonight, there are three performances exclusive for TCG attendees, as well as discounted tickets to The Wiz at Caramu House. So I encourage you to see as much as you can, see some theater tonight. Who knows who you might be bowing down for later. <laughs> Before we kick off our next plenary session, sponsored by Westlake Reed Laskowski, I'm excited to share something truly special with you. As a part of TCG's equity, diversity, and inclusion initiative, we've embarked on our Legacy Leaders of Color project. For the past year and a half, <laughs> with the amazing support of Ty Defoe, TCG has been working with a production company to record the stories of nine founders of theaters of color. These leaders created opportunities lacking for artists, challenged cultural appropriation and misrepresentation by staging the full complexity of racial and ethnic identities. They fought for political power and, created, and creative autonomy, and against all obstacles, they made and continue to make brilliant and beautiful theater. We hope this video series will not only honor the elders, but also serve as a roadmap for future leaders. Through this project, we hope to raise cultural awareness, broad, broader cultural awareness of the essential role of theaters of color and the role that they play in our field. What I'm about to share with you now is a sneak peek just a sizzle reel of those nine videos. The arts are not a, uh, a luxury. The arts are not something to be cast away. The arts are essential to the process, to humanization. And so I think it's worthy of, of a fight. This just is not about Jackie Taylor. This is about a spiritual, movement that must happen. It's so important, it's so sacred, it is so powerful, it can do so many things. Our plays gave voice to those who were, if not voiceless, seldom heard in America. Theater is my citizenship. It's my way to change the world. It's the way I engage the world. It's the way that I move my community. I was not the smartest. I was not the best. I was not the greatest. I was not the only Chinese American writer or Chinese writer at the time. I got more African American plays by African American men and women than any other producer in the history of the American theater. We were tall, we were short, we were skinny, we were fat, we were gay, we were straight. Out there, the world said, no, you can't. And we said, oh, yes, we can. From that beginning, and I became enchanted with the idea of being on a stage. You do not give up a part of yourself to become something else. I'm doing theater on the picket line is it worth dying for? And I decided, yes. I mean, I have no choice. I was uh, a precocious, you know, when I was taught the ABCs by my parents at three years old. I fell in love with, 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 with words and ultimately language. And that became my passion. And that's the key. 
You've got to know why you're here. You've got to have an aesthetic that guides you. You've got to have something to say. And you develop that by study. Theater is a business. It's, it's an art form, but OK, if you don't think of it as a business, then you need to do that art form in your house. We're still struggling, you know, how do you create art? How do you make it livable for our artists? How do we take care of our staff? Everybody said in the success, of, but we at the top had to take responsibility for even our failures. And, but you need strong people. Yeah, absolutely. To be able to do that. I produced with an array of major American artists. So why the theater? because that is the first uh, medium that impressed me to move, to do something. We have all this rich heritage to pull from, and, but we need these institutions to pull it out and let them know that they belong to us. We have to talk about the history that pertains to most of us. It's more, it's more than anything. It's, it's, it's not leaving, it's the giving that's, that's important to me. I found out that you only have to get up one more time. That's all you have to do. You just keep getting up one more time. out these videos over the summer and fall. I really can't wait to share these videos with you. Our next plenary speaker may help us re-envision how we tell stories and recommit to the power to change the world. Since its founding in 2003, StoryCorps has recorded over 50,000 interviews of everyday American stories, all of which are archived at the Library of Congress. For this work, founder Dave Isay has received a MacArthur Genius Award, four Peabody Awards, and the 2015 TED Prize. Please, please join me in welcoming Dave Isay to the stage. Thank you, Dave. Hi, it's so great to be here. Who's got that white popcorn on their hands? Oh my God. Um, I am so honored and humbled to be here at uh, TCG. I feel such kinship with you all and uh, so grateful for the hard work you do 365 days a year and nights a year to bring joy and art and meaning and magic into people's lives. You guys are just amazing. Um, okay, so StoryCorps. Has anybody here participated in StoryCorps? Couple people, okay. And who, who here has like heard StoryCorps on the radio? <laughs> And who doesn't know what StoryCorps is and can't wait till this is over so you can go drink? I heard you have beer pong tonight or something like that. <laughs> Somebody doesn't know what StoryCorps is, or this will be like the first time in history. Okay. Well, you all, that's great. Well, um, I'm still going to, I think someone's lying, so I'm going to explain what StoryCorps is. <laughs> so we, um, as uh, Dafina said, we started uh, about a dozen years ago in Grand Central Terminal. I used to be a documentary radio maker for public radio. And I was a social justice documentary maker. I did a lot of stuff in prisons and um, uh, homeless shelters. And I saw that when um, I would interview people who often you know, felt like their lives didn't matter, that sitting there and asking them, who are you? What have you learned in life? How do you want to be remembered? That you could almost see people's backs straighten. And it was important and sometimes a transformative um, moment in their lives. And I decided a dozen years ago to try this kind of crazy experiment and take documentary and turn it on its head. So doing documentaries has traditionally been about like interviewing people for a movie or a radio or whatever, whatever medium it is. And hopefully a lot of people seeing that um, and, uh, and it becomes a work of education or art or whatever that, that many people experience and benefit from. And what I wanted to do was to say that the end product isn't the purpose anymore. It's the act of having people listen to each other. And I wanted to give as many people as possible the chance to sit um, and be listened to, especially people who might have felt like their lives didn't matter. Um, and uh, tried this experiment in Grand Central where we, we built a booth where you can come with anyone who you want to honor by listening to their story, a parent, grandparent, friend, 
um, and you sit across from them for 40 minutes. There's a facilitator in the booth with you, and you talk and you listen. Many people think of it as if I had 40 minutes left to live, what would I say and ask of this person who, who means so much to me? Very intense interviews, um, lots of tissue used in the booth. Um, we've done, we've actually done uh, 50,000, 50 or 60,000 of these, and I don't think there's one where someone hasn't actually cried when they're having this conversation. Um, and at the end of the interview, you get, a, you get a digital copy or a CD, and another one stays with us and goes to the Library of Congress, so your great, 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 great grandkids can get to know your, um, your grandmother through her voice and story. So when we launched this thing, I didn't know if it was going to work at all. Um, but, um, and, and I had, you know, I was up nights with anxiety of like, would we have Jerry Springer moments and someone would bring a gun and kill someone in the booth and I didn't know what was going to happen. But it opened and it worked. Um, and, uh, and since then we've recorded many of these stories and we actually do do broadcasts on NPR, which you've heard in animations. And I'm going to play you a bunch of stuff today. Um, some stuff that hopefully will speak to some of the work that you're doing. Um, some stuff that's just fun, some stuff that is not so fun. Um, and, uh, and, and then we can ask, uh, do some questions afterwards. So I'm going to start just by playing um, one of the kind of foundation stories of StoryCorps, uh, and then we'll get into kind of the present and some other stuff. And this is, this is an interview that happened in the first um, week of, uh, of StoryCorps. Uh, this is a couple who came to the booth. His name uh, is, uh, was Danny Parasa. His wife is Annie, as you see. Danny was an OTB clerk in New York, an off-track betting clerk, and Annie was a nurse. And uh, they came to StoryCorps to tell the story of their first date that had happened 25, 24, 25 years before. So this is week one of StoryCorps a dozen years ago in our booth, our first booth in Grand Central Terminal, Danny and Annie Parasa telling the story of their first date. She started to talk and I said, listen, I'm gonna deliver a speech. I said, at the end, you're gonna wanna go home. I said, you represent a 34 letter word I said, that word is love. I said, if we're going anywhere, we're going down the aisle because I'm too tired, too sick, and too sore to do any other damn thing. And she turned around and she said, oh, of course I'll marry you. And the next morning I called her as early as I possibly could. And he always gets up early. <laughs> to, make, to make sure mm -hmm. she hadn't changed her mind, and she hadn't. And uh, every year on, on April 22nd, around 3 o'clock, I call her and ask her if it was today, would she do it again? And so far, the answer's been the same. Yeah, 25 times yes. <laughs> you, you see, the thing of it is, I always feel guilty when I say I love you to you, and I say it so often. I say it to remind you that as dumpy as I am, it's coming for me. It's, it's like hearing a beautiful song from a busted old radio. And it's nice of you to keep the radio around the house. If I don't have a note on the kitchen table, I think there's something wrong. You write a love letter to me well, every morning. the only morning. thing that could possibly be wrong is I couldn't find a silly pen. To my princess, the weather out today is extremely rainy. I'll call you at 11.20 in the morning. It's a romantic weather and report. And I love you, I love you, I love you. When a guy is happily married, no matter what happens at work, no matter what happens in the rest of the day, there's a shelter when you get home. There's a knowledge, knowing that you can hug somebody without them throwing you downstairs and saying, get your hands off me. And it, it, being married is like having a color television set. You never want to go back to black and white. So we fell in love with Danny and Annie. Danny and Annie fell in love with StoryCorps. They came back over and over again um, to record their love letters to each other. Danny brought every character he had ever met in his life to StoryCorps. Um, <laughs> undercover narcotics detectives, major league umpires. And actually, one of the secrets of StoryCorps is that at the very beginning when we opened up, like nobody actually wanted to come except Danny and Annie and a few other people. It was like this crazy thing. Now we have like, you know, we'll fill up, so we'll have a thousand people waiting list in two minutes. But fortunately, a few kind of crazy people like Danny and Annie got it. Um, it got to the point where Danny would call us in the office on a Friday and say, you know, on Monday, I have to get a cataract removed. Do you need me to come and document it later in the week? And we'd say, sure, Danny, whatever you want. <laughs> but, you know, I, I think Danny um, and Annie both personified so much of what, what StoryCorps is about, um, at which you guys, you know, understand in your blood, the, the beauty and the poetry and the power and the grace in, in language and in the words and, and, and in the voices of, of regular people, um, people all around us when we take the time to listen. Um, 
Danny um, was, I mean, you, you see him there. He was uh, five feet tall. He had very, his eyes were very crossed. He had one snaggle tooth, but the guy had more romance than all of Hollywood's leading men put together. He actually ended up um, being diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. And um, we, we the, the week he was diagnosed, it, he, we renamed our booth in a ceremony with Danny and Annie, our first booth, our Grand Central booth, the Danny and Annie Parasa booth. And then the next week, Danny was too sick to come to StoryCorps, but he called us and he asked us if we would come to his home in Bay Ridge so he could record a final interview with Annie. Um, and of course, we said yes. And um, we went to Bay Ridge. And this is, um, this is a little bit of the conversation that they had that day. The illness is not hard on me. It's just, you know, the finality of it. And him, he goes along like a trooper. Listen. Even downhill, a car doesn't roll unless it's pushed, and you're giving me a great push. The deal of it is, we try to give each other hope, and not hope that I'll live, hope that she'll do well after I pass, hope that people will support her, hope that if she meets somebody and likes him, she marries him. You know, he has everything planned, you know. I'm working on it. She said it was her call. She wants to walk out behind the casket alone. I guess that's the way to do it, because when we were married, you know how your brother takes you down, your father takes you down? She said, well, I don't know which of my brothers to walk in with. I don't want to offend anybody. I said, I got a solution. I said, you walk in with me, you walk out with me. And the other day, I said, who's going to walk down the aisle with you behind the casket? You know, because the supporter. And she said, nobody. I walked in with you alone. I walked out with you alone. Mm -hmm. There's a thing in life where you have to come to terms with dying. Well, I haven't come to terms with dying yet. I want to come to terms with being sure that you understand that my love for you up to this point was as much as it could be and will be as much as it could be for eternity. I always said the only thing I have to give you is a poor gift, and it's myself. And I always gave it. And if there's a way to come back and give it, I'll do that too. Do you have the Valentine's Day letter there? Yeah. My dearest wife, this is a very special day. It is a day on which we share our love, which still grows after all these years. Now that love is being used by us to sustain us through these hard times. All my love, all my days, and more. Happy Valentine's Day. I could write on and on about her. She lights up the room in the morning when she tells me to put both hands on her shoulders so she can support me. She lights up my life when she says to me at night, wouldn't you like a little ice cream? Or would you please drink more water? I mean, those aren't very romantic things to say. But they stir my heart. In my mind, in my heart, there has never been, there is not now, and never will be another Annie. So we recorded that story on a Thursday, and we broadcast it on NPR on Morning Edition the next Friday. And Danny died about um, an hour and a half, two hours after the broadcast. Um, Annie received thousands and thousands and thousands of letters from um, and emails from public radio listeners. She actually took a, a, um, a copy of those and buried them with, with Danny because he was a guy who had felt that he had been, you know, not really listened to and made fun of a lot in his life. And she wanted those to be with him. And she kept a copy for herself. And all these years later, she still um, reads one of those instead of the love letter that she would have gotten from Danny. Here's one of them. Um, and so that, that was certainly, you know, one of the kind of foundational aha kind of moments of, of StoryCorps. Um, I'm going to do one other foundational kind of Father's Day story for you. Um, as I said, you know, StoryCorps is a social justice um, project. We, um, we, 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 half of our slots are held for, we, so half our slots, people hear about us on NPR, um, which we love, it's great. 
um, but it's also largely upper middle class, white, middle class, white. Um, so um, the other half of our slots, we work with um, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of community groups across the country each year. Um, so it could be juvenile justice groups or um, homeless groups or immigrants' rights groups so that, they, um, so that they can tell the people that they serve about StoryCorps and those folks can come to the booth and be listened to in this way by a loved one or a family member. We also do um, a, a loved one or a friend or whoever it is. We also do these big special initiatives. Um, first one we did was with 9-11 families, so everyone who lost a loved one on September 11th comes to StoryCorps to leave a record um, of that person's life. And um, a bunch of years ago, we launched something called the GRIO Initiative. GRIO is a West African uh, word for storyteller, and it's now the largest collection of African-American um, voices and stories ever gathered. But in the very first month of GRIO, we opened in Atlanta at the King Center, and um, I was privileged to go down at the end of that month um, to a GRIO reception where a couple of hundred families came and we played stories and talked. And one of the people who was there was um, a man named Lynn Weaver, who was who was one of the first people who, um, who recorded a griot story. He came with his, his daughter, and uh, he wanted to remember his father. His father's name was Ted Weaver. Ted Weaver worked as a janitor and a chauffeur in Knoxville, Tennessee, and Lynn came to StoryCorps um, to, talk about, uh, to talk about this man. My father was everything to me, and it's actually kind of difficult talking about him without becoming very emotional. Up until, you know, he died, every decision I made, I'd always call him. And he would never tell me what to do, but he would always listen and say, well, what do you want to do? And he made me feel that I could do anything that I wanted to do. I can remember when we integrated to schools that there were many times when I was uh, just scared. And uh, I, I didn't think that uh, I would survive. And I'd look up and he'd be there. And whenever I saw him, I knew that I was safe. You know, I always tell you that your, your mama is the smartest person I've ever met. But I think my father ranks right up there as, <laughs> as, as brilliant. When I was in high school, I was taking algebra. And I was sitting at the kitchen table trying to do my homework. And I got frustrated. said, so I just can't figure this out. I'm just. So my father said, what's the problem? He came by. He said, what's the problem? And I said, that's this algebra. And he said, well, let me look at it. I said, Dad, they didn't even have algebra in your day. <laughs> and I went to sleep. And around 4 o'clock that morning, he woke me up. He said, come on, son, get up. He set me at the kitchen table, and he taught me algebra. What he had done is sit up all night and read the algebra book. And then he explained the problems to me so I could do them and understand them. <laughs> and to this day, I live my life trying to be half the man my father was, just half the man. And uh, I would be a success if my children loved me half as much as I loved my father. So I got an email um, the day after the Griot reception that said, um, Mr. I say, you'll never know how honored and touched I was by the playing of the remembrance of my dad. After I got home, I realized that the evening of the Griot reception was the anniversary of my father's death. Even in death, he continues to embrace me with his love. Signed, Lynn Weaver, Chairman of Surgery, Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, oh, and I have a picture of him. So that's Ted Weaver, who, um, and, and you know, uh, to, that, you know I, I think in so many ways, Ted Weaver is, uh, is the kind of person that StoryCorps um, was, created to honor and is the kind of uh, person we should be holding up to our kids as examples of who they can and should grow up to become and who we should be building statues to and and talking about and, and celebrating. I remember, um, I you know, Lynn uh, is, Lynn Weaver, his son, the surgeon, who's an incredibly b busy man, will travel all over the country if I ask him to come and do an event uh, to talk about his father anytime on the drop his hat, at the drop of the hat. He told me a story about um, how uh, he was one time um, he, when he was integrating those schools with his brother uh, in uh, in Tennessee that uh, they were the only two African Americans on a on a on the football team, and uh, he he told me that one day uh, there was an away game in a small town out in Tennessee and there were they were the only two African Americans of in both teams, 
And on one of the plays, his brother hit one of the opposing players, and the player went down, and he was hurt. And the two of them saw this. Th there was a football field, and then um, there were stands full of the home uh, team's families, and then there were there was a fence in the back, and he, and he saw the entire uh, gr grandstand rising up and coming towards them. This kid was on the ground, and he and his brother um, backed up and backed up and backed up as this crowd was coming towards them, and finally they hit the fence. And Lynn said that he looked behind him, and there was his dad. There was, there was Ted, and he tapped his brother on the shoulder, and he said, you know, dad's here, we're safe. And they were, They're, his father got them out. So, um, so, so those are, those are two kind of early story core stories. And I have so many stories I can keep you like past beer pong. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who here's actually doing beer pong? Raise your hand. Wow, uh, you're all lying again. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna play some, um, I'm gonna play a story um, th uh, that um, I was thinking about today. Um, we're all thinking obviously about Charleston this week. Um, and I want to play the story that we played, um, the aired the week of Ferguson, which is, believe it or not, almost a year ago. It was August. Um, uh, this is a story with Alex Landau and his mother, um, his mother, uh, Patsy. Um, Alex uh, was, uh, is adopted and uh, grew up in a suburb of Denver and came to StoryCorps with his mom to talk about um, uh, uh, his uh, growing up and how race has influenced his life and also what happened one night when the police uh, pulled him over on a traffic stop. So this is Alex Landau and his mom, Patsy. I was about four years old and a little girl on the playground came up to me and said, not all white kids like to play with black kids. You grabbed her and told her, you don't talk to my son like that. Yeah the one that hurt me the most. You were eight years old and outside on a really very hot day, covered from head to toe with a long sleeve shirt. And I didn't understand why you were dressed like that. And you said, because you didn't want your skin to get any darker. We never talked about race growing up. I just don't think that was ever a conversation. I thought that love would conquer all and skin color really didn't matter. I had to learn the really hard way when they almost killed you. Yeah, I was 19 years old. I had picked up a friend and I noticed that we had red and blue lights behind us. We were being pulled over. The officer explained I had made an illegal left turn and to step out of the car. So I get out of the car first. He pats me down and then he goes around to the passenger side and pulls my friend Addison out of the car. Addison is white. Yeah, Addison is white and he had some weed in his coat pocket. So he gets placed in handcuffs. I figure that everything's okay. I'm not in handcuffs, I've already been patted down, plus there's three officers on the scene. And I had never had a negative interaction with police in my life. So I ask them, can I please see a warrant before you continue the search? And they grab me and begin to hit me in the face. I could hear Addison in the background yelling, stop, leave him alone. I was hit several times. And I remember gasping for air and spitting and blood flying across the grass. And then I hear an officer shout out, he's reaching for a gun. I immediately started yelling, no, I'm not. I'm not reaching for anything. And I remember an officer say, if he doesn't calm down, we're going to have to shoot him. I could feel the gun pressed to my head. I expected to be shot. And at that point, I lost consciousness. I woke up to a multitude of officers just standing around me laughing. One officer was like, where's that warrant now, you fucking nigger? It took 45 stitches to close up the lacerations in my face alone. How did it feel when you got the call that I was in jail? I was in the middle of teaching a second grade class. All she said was, you'd better come see about your son. She didn't say anything about what kind of shape you were in. What about when you finally saw me? All I remember is involuntarily screaming. That was the first time I had cried the entire time I had been in there. And it wasn't my injuries that hurt. It was just seeing how it devastated you. My whole world view changed that night. Yeah. For me, it was the point of awakening to how the rest of the world is going to look at you. I was just another black face in the streets. And I was almost another dead black male.
another story that um, came to mind this week. Um, it's hard to, with all the crazy, horrible shit that happens week in and week out, it's hard to keep track of this stuff. But um, I don't know if you remember a couple of months ago um, in North Carolina, there were three uh, Muslim kids uh, who were murdered. Um, um, uh, in the two of them were married and one was the um, sister of uh, one of the people who was murdered. They were, um, um, they were shot. Uh, it turns out that one of the kids, they were all college students, had come to StoryCorps uh, just a couple of months before she was murdered. And uh, the morning that she was murdered, uh, we, as, 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 you know, this is what happens when we have an archive as big as, as StoryCorps. Um, her name matched up in the archive and we found out that she had recorded. Uh, so that day, um, we cut it to, for broadcast on, on NPR the next day. Uh, she had come to StoryCorps with her principal uh, from when she was in grade school. This woman was the principal of all of three of the young people who were murdered. Um, um, and uh, they recorded an interview. So what you're going to hear now is the interview with this young woman who was murdered. Her name was Yusur Abu Salha and her teacher, um, her principal, who's uh, Musarat Jadin. Um, and then we also asked um, her principal, uh, to come back in and talk about um, about Usor and the other kids. So you're going to hear a little bit of um, of, of uh, Musrat um, talking after the murder, and a little bit of um, of Usor's voice a couple of months before she was killed. Hey, hello. My name is Yusor Abu Salha. I am 20 years old. We are in Durham, North Carolina, and today I will be interviewing my former teacher and principal. Growing up in America has been such a blessing, and although in some ways I do stand out, such yes. as you know the hijab, the, yes. the head covering, um, there's still so many ways that I feel so embedded in the fabric that is our culture, and here we're all one. I still remember in third grade when we asked for something, you used to say, don't put your hand like this. You would have your hand facing downward. Oh my God, you yeah. still remember. And then you'd flip your hand over and you'd open your hand upward as you know a giving gesture. You know, be giving, open, compassionate. Dia, Yusur, and Razan, these kids, their face was so radiant. They would just bring life to the room. And they treat me like their mother. I see you nowadays, you're always asking how are you, you know, where are you now in life? And now I'm at NC State University. And got married to one of my other students. Yeah. <laughs> I was so happy, you know, when I saw you guys together. And you will be together for the rest of your life, inshallah. Before our time's up, Sister Jabeen, I'd just like to thank you. It's been an honor. No, I want to thank you, Yusuf, and the honor is mine. Thank, thank you, you so much. Of course. I would like people to know and remember her as a practicing Muslim, as a daughter, and above all, as a good human being. You know, when we write our comments on report cards, we say they exceeded our expectations. She exceeded our expectations. Another story, and then maybe we can talk a little bit, answer some questions if you have them. Um, so this is another kind of example of the remarkable things that happen in a story core booth. And, you know, listening to these stories, a lot of things come to mind. I mean, I heard in the, that fantastic um, video uh, uh, montage uh, before, before it came out, the idea of, um, of, of, of generosity. And I feel like story core is so much about generosity. It's kind of the opposite of reality TV. You know, nobody comes to StoryCorps to get rich. No one comes to get famous. It's just an act of, of, of generosity and love. And the microphone gives you the license to talk about things that you just don't normally get to talk about um, in, uh, you know, kind of day-to-day -day interactions and to say things that matter. I think it actually has a lot in common in some ways with, um, with um, hospice work. You know, they, they, they say there, there's this um, um, ho hospice folks talk about this idea of the the four things you want to say to someone um, and, or, or have said to you uh, before you die or, 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 or a loved one dies, which is thank you, I love you, forgive me, and I forgive you. And I feel like in many ways what the StoryCorps booth gives you the chance, hopefully, I mean, we're all dying, you know, 
in some respect, but hopefully we're not actively dying and it gives you the chance to have that sort of closure with, with someone you care about now um, and, um, and, and to be in that moment and to, to tell someone how much they mean to you by looking in them in the eyes and, and listening to them. Um, another example of the extraordinary um, stuff, uh, interactions that can happen in, a booth, in the booth. This is O'Shea Israel and uh, Mary Johnson. This is a story of hope. Um, it's also a story of, 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 of a murder. Um, O'Shea Israel, when he was 16 years old, um, killed a young man named Lorraineum Bird. He was a gang member. Lorraineum Bird was a gang member. They got in a fight at a party. Um, Lorraineum Bird was Mary Johnson's only son. Um, O'Shea Israel uh, went to prison and about a dozen years into his prison sentence, Mary came to the penitentiary to visit him and to talk to the person who had murdered her son. Um, they developed a friendship and she ended up coming back um, uh, numerous times and when he was released, he actually moved in next door to her. Um, so this is a conversation that they had a few months after O'Shea was released from the penitentiary at StoryCorps. Um, O'Shea Israel and the mother of uh, the young man that he murdered. You and I met at Stillwater Prison. I wanted to know if you were in the same mindset of what I remember from court, where I wanted to go over and hurt you, but you were not that 16-year-old. You were a grown man. I shared with you about my son. And he became human to me. You know, when I met you, it was like, okay, this guy is real. And then when it was time to go, you broke down and started shedding tears. And the initial thing to do was just try to hold you up as best I can. Just hug you like I would my own mother, you know. After you left the room, I began to say, I just hugged the man that murdered my son. And I instantly knew that all that anger and the animosity all the stuff I had in my heart for 12 years for you, I knew it was over, that I had totally forgiven you. As far as receiving forgiveness from you, sometimes I still don't know how to take it because I haven't totally forgiven myself yet. It's something that I'm learning from you. I won't say that I have learned yet because it's still a process that I'm going through. I treat you as I would treat my son and our relationship is beyond belief. We live next door to one another. Yeah, so you can see what I'm doing. You know, firsthand. Mm -hmm. We actually bump into each other all the time, leaving in and out of the house. And you know, our conversations, they come from, boy, how come you ain't called over here to check on me in a couple <laughs> of days? <laughs> you ain't even asked me if I need my garbage to go out. Uh -huh. I find those things funny <laughs> because it's a relationship with a mother for real. Well. My natural son is no longer here. I didn't see him graduate. You know, you're going to college. I'll have the opportunity to see you graduate. I didn't see him get married. Hopefully one day I'll be able to experience that with you. And just to hear you say those things and to be in my life in the manner in which you are is my motivation. It motivates me to make sure that I stay on the right path. You still believe in me. And the fact that you can do it despite how much pain I'll cause you, it's amazing. I know it's not an easy thing, you know, to be able to share our story together, even with us sitting here looking at each other right now. I know it's not an easy thing. So I admire that you can do this. I love you, lady. I love you too, son. I think there's, there, I do think there's um, so much um, that we share in common, the work that you do and the work that we do at StoryCorps. I mean, I think what, what I, I like to think that we're doing um, every week on NPR when we do these broadcasts is that we're kind of shaking people on the shoulder um, with these authentic voices, you know, um, and reminding people, you know, like, this is what's important. This is what's important. This is why we're alive. And that's what you guys do all the time for so many people in theaters like this across the country every single day of the year. And I can speak for the whole country to say how grateful we are to you for bringing such joy and, and, um, and, and feeling and power and, and grace.
news to, to the American public. Um, I, I, I want to play one. Um, I, I have, I, like, I'm starting to freak out because I have so many stories I want to play and we're running out of time. <laughs> Um, but I pulled this um, just because it's a story um, up, up from, from you. Um, and I don't know if, um, I, I, I actually, this is, a, I, when I go on book tour, sometimes I meet people from StoryCorps stories, but I've never met this family. And I, and I don't know if Jonathan or Ricardo are here. Are they? Okay. They're from the um, Mixed Magic Theater in Rhode Island. Um, and this is a StoryCorps interview that they did. Um, uh, this is a Ricardo Pitts, Pitts Wiley telling his son Jonathan about a moment that shaped his life. He was a teenager in Michigan uh, when he was uh, bused to a new high school in 1968. I got bused to a high school in my sophomore year from a school that there was a large African-American black population to a school that were, we were 2% of the population. And it was awful just awful, uh, getting bust. Even though I always thought I had intelligence, I never felt like I, I wanted to even try to use it there. So I did just enough to get by. In my junior year, a teacher there, Bob Price, put me in a play, Romeo and Juliet. And I was the only black kid in the play, and I caught hell. I caught hell from the white kids at this school, and I caught hell from the black kids. And in some ways, it forced me, caused me to distance myself from both of them. Neither one of them were willing to support what I wanted. So I became kind of single-minded in that respect. And opening night, I came out on stage with this kind of fake beard and this big floppy mushroom hat made out of upholstery fabric that the director's wife had made. And everybody burst into laughter. And what could have been a crushing moment in my life really was just something different. I, you know, I just said, no, I'm, I'm not going to give in. And I had this little squeaky voice, and, and I just kind of dug in, and I just begged for this voice, the spirit of Brock Peters, who was, you know, who was very much alive at that time. But I always loved his voice, Brock Peters, all those muscles and everything. You know, he was like a black man with big voice and muscles and bad, you know, Porgy and Bess, all that stuff. And I said, I need that voice, Brock. And he sent it to me. And a voice came out, and I was the prince. Not a big part, but I was the prince. And after that opening scene, when I walked off stage, I said, that's it. This is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. So Ricardo is the um, co-founder of the Mixed Magic Theater in Rhode Island. And Jonathan, who I think recently graduated from Yale, is now the artistic director there. Um, okay, I'm going to do one more story before we start taking questions. And this is just because it kind of reminds me of that one a little bit. Um, one of the, um, one of the, our most, we have a couple of um, very recent initiatives. Um, one is the Military Voices Initiative, celebrating the stories of, um, of post 9-11 vets and, and their families. Um, and um, uh, I know that, um, that, that you folks uh, are doing a, a lot of work with, with vets, which is, uh, um, fantastic and incredibly important. I'm not going to play one of those stories. I am going to play a story from our newest initiative, which is called Out Loud, which is um, celebrating the stories of LGBT folks across the country. Um, I, you know, a little backstory. My, um, I was, um, I'm the proud son of a gay father, um, and uh, I, um, I found out my dad was gay right about when I was starting in, in radio. Um, and he became a, a, a well known, he was a, a, a psychiatrist and it was a pretty well known gay activist after he came out of the closet. Um, I actually did my first radio documentary 30 years ago um, in honor of him. It was uh, about Stonewall. It was the first uh, documentary ever done about Stonewall, which of course was the Rosa Parks movement for the gay rights, uh, the Rosa Parks moment for the gay rights movement uh, in 1969. And my dad, who was a, um, who was a very um, active, you know, vibrant, wonderful man who was still seeing patients uh, 40 hours a week a couple of years ago, got diagnosed with um, cancer and was dead five days later, actually on the anniversary of Stonewall. Um, he died. Um, and I should say that, you know, I had done an interview with my dad, um, a StoryCorps interview, and hadn't really thought about it. But when I listened to it on the night that he died at three in the morning, um, and I knew I have two young, I'm an old dad, I have two young kids at home, and I knew that this was the only way that my too young, my two kids are going to get to know this man who was such a towering figure in my life. 
um, uh, was through this reporting. Um, that's when the rubber really hit the road. I mean, I thought I couldn't believe in StoryCorps any more than I did, but at that, that moment, you know, I, I, it really hit me. So this is, this is we launched um, Out Loud this year, this past year at Stonewall, and this is the first story that we um, broadcast, and it's another fa Father's Day story. This is 70-year-old Patrick Haggerty uh, and his daughter, um, Robin. Um, he is the son of a dairy farmer in very rural uh, Washington State in the 1950s. Um, and he uh, came to StoryCorps to, in part, remember uh, a school assembly when he was a teenager um, and uh, that he was part of and, uh, and what happened with him and his dad after that assembly. I'm riding to school with my oldest brother and on the way to school, I'm putting glitter all over my face. And my brother said, what in the hell are you doing? I said, I'm putting on my costume. He said, well, I wouldn't be caught dead wearing that. So he dropped me off at the school and he called my dad up and he said, Dad, I think you better get up there. This is not going to look good. So my dad drove up to the high school and he had his farmer jeans on and they had cow crap on them and he had his clodhopper boots on. And when I saw him coming, I ducked around the hall and hid from him. And it wasn't because of what I was wearing. <laughs> it was because of what he was wearing. So. The assembly goes well, and I climb in the car, and I'm riding home with my father. And my father says to me, uh, I was walking down the hall this morning, and I saw a kid that looked a lot like you ducking around the hall to avoid his dad, but I know it wasn't you because you would never do that to your dad. And I squirmed in my seat, and I finally busted out, and I said, well, Dad, did you have to wear your cow crap jeans <laughs> to my assembly? And he said, look. Everybody knows I'm a dairy farmer. This is who I am. And he looked me square in the eye. And then he said, now how about you? When you're a full grown man, who are you gonna go out with at night? And I said, I don't know. And he said, I think you do know. And it's not gonna be that McLaughlin girl that's been making goo goo eyes at you, but you won't even pick up the damn telephone. And I'm gonna tell you something today and you might not know what to think of it now, but you're gonna remember when you're an adult, don't sneak. Because if you sneak like you did today, it means you think you're doing the wrong thing. And if you run around and spend in your whole life thinking that you're doing the wrong thing, then you'll ruin your immortal soul. And out of all the things a father in 1959 could have told his gay son, my father tells me to be proud of myself and not sneak. My reaction at the time was to get out in the hayfield and pretend like I was as much of a man as I could be. And I remember flipping 50 pound bales three feet up into the air going, I'm not a queer, what's he talking about? <laughs> but he knew where I was headed. And he, he knew that making me feel bad about it in any way was the wrong thing to do. I had the patron saint of dads for sissies. And no, I didn't know it at the time but I know it now. Okay, so any, a couple questions? Oh, there go the mics, or you, you can just shout. Okay. <laughs> All right, we'll play more stories. You got it. What do you want, funny or sad or? <laughs> okay. All right, you want funny? All right, this is pretty funny. All right, and then I'm going to play an animation. So we so sorry TCG, no questions. <laughs> I promise, but <laughs> All right. So let's do this and then we'll play an animation and and you guys can go play beer pong. Um okay, so so um this is a story that has nothing to do with anything, really, but you asked for it. Um, this is Laura Greenberg, um, who came to StoryCorps, actually in Atlanta, um, although this is a very New York story, to talk about growing up in Queens in the 1950s. Um, so this is Laura and her daughter, um, and, uh, and it speaks for itself. My father would be in his boxer shorts in front of the stereo with a baton. He loved classical music and he would play it really loud, and he would conduct the orchestra. And he's a little fat, bald man, 
and he'd get behind the wheel of a car and he'd become like a Napoleon. He became nuts. He gave everybody the finger. He never used the brakes. And I remember being so frightened, I'd sit in the back on the floor crying because I said, we're going to die. Mm -hmm. The problem growing up in my home was that I didn't know what was normal. We're yelling and we're pinching and we're hugging and we're cursing and we peed with the door open. I mean, I didn't know this was not normal behavior. I didn't know people had secrets. You didn't tell your mother everything. When did you learn? Well, it's still hard. <laughs> Who were your old boyfriends? How many did you have before I didn't before have that? a lot of boyfriends. I had the neighbor boy. My mother loved him, but he wore his pants really high and he had an underbite. Oh, God. But nobody wanted to have sex with me, really, till I met your father. He was cute, but very, very quiet, and I scared the crap out of him. The first time he kissed me, he had a nosebleed all over his face. He was so nervous. <laughs> it was terrible. It was, uh, I don't know. Still married 35 years later. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Has your life been different than what you imagined? Yeah, a little bit. I married a Jewish lawyer, and he makes no money, so... I thought I'd found success, and, you know, he's an indigent defense criminal lawyer, and um, he saves lives. So a little while later, the um, criminal lawyer husband, Carl, came to StoryCorps to rebut that So interview. your first kiss, we heard about how you bled all over mom. Do you have any different take on that story? That's how it happened, but I do have some Laura stories. We were having people over. She was going to make spaghetti, didn't have enough. So she broke the package of spaghetti in half. So she figured she had twice as much. And Carl had to explain to me, a pound is a pound. <laughs> so we make a very odd couple. He's from a New England family. And I remember we would sit at the dinner table at his house when we were dating, and no one would talk. And then I would start to giggle. I would get this, like, psychotic, hysterical laughter. So they already knew I was nuts. And I said, this is so refreshing. They don't ask about when I'm getting my period or how much money I make or did I make a duty today. You know, my family was so intrusive. Your mother wasn't very happy with me. No. She thought my name was Paul for many years. Mark. Mark? Mm -hmm. She mm. said, this is my son-in-law, Mark. And I'd say, Ma, his name's Carl. She'd say, son of a bitch, I can't remember his name. <laughs> It's so weird because our family now is the most functional of all of our friends. I mean, all my friends, they'd rather hang out at my house with my parents than hang out with me. But Rebecca was the one who said she really wanted to do a story car interview. You know, when I listen on my way to work, I'm crying and my mascara is running and they're very tender, you know, heartfelt stories. And I said, they're not ever going to play ours. But we didn't do it for that. We just did it to to have that experience and share that moment and have it forever. Um, we, so I, actually, I want to I just recognize one person in the audience. Um, who Meredith Burkus, are you there still, or did you leave? Oh, there she is. So um, this is another reason why I feel, uh, many reasons why I feel uh, such um, uh, brotherhood and sisterhood with you all. Meredith, who um, used to, who comes from the public theater, worked with us at StoryCorps for a couple of years and uh, sprinkled her theater uh, organizational management dust on us and helped us get to a new level. And then, uh, sadly for us, but happily for the theater world, uh, we lost her uh, to theater again. But it's great to see you again, Meredith. Thank you for coming. I, I also want to talk, I know this is... Uh, we had a, we had a game change moment at StoryCorps um, a couple of months ago, um, where um, we got this thing called the TED Prize. And I actually um, I had actually never TED is this thing you watch videos. I'd never seen a TED video when I won this thing, um, but I was um, but I watched and they're great, whatever. And um, <laughs> but the the uh, it was a million dollars to come up with a dream, and um, this happened. We found out about it. Um, uh, late last year, and then um, I gave a TED Talk a couple months ago, and um, we created very quickly an app 
Um, and you know, as I said, the story core, the signature story core has always been that, um, that you uh, record an interview with the help of a facilitator who's this person whose job it is to bear witness to these interviews and they kind of are collecting, um, we're, we're going around the country collecting the wisdom of humanity, these amazing human beings who do this work. Um, but we created an app which is kind of a digital facilitator so that um, when you, um, you, you can go on, select your questions, record your interview, and then with one tap, um, it uploads to the Library of Congress. So it was, it's, it, it, again, it was like one of those moments like at the creation of StoryCorps, I was very worried about what would happen. You know, the internet is such a coarsening place. And the last two months as I've listened, and I only, I'm running around a lot, so I'm listening like driving to get groceries on Sunday night or on the subway. Um, but the stuff that's coming in on the app, and we've had thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of interviews come in already just in a couple of weeks, more interviews than we get in a year. And the quality is not as good as what you hear in the booth. And the interviews aren't 40 minutes, they're usually 20 minutes or 15 minutes. But again, you know, people have picked it up with fidelity. And you know, it's happening in schools and small towns in the Midwest and the South and families, you know, sitting in a basement and having these like profound conversations or in their bedroom under the covers and it's so intimate and beautiful to eavesdrop on. Um, and uh, you know, I should, you know, if, if StoryCorps changed me um, in the last um, 12 years, uh, in one way, I would say that it's made me much more hopeful. Um, and I think that once again, I'm going through this like hopeful thing over the last bunch of weeks, hearing, um, hearing what's happening. And I hope that we can figure out a way to use this with, um, with this community as well, um, who does such an amazing job of, um, of serving the public um, to, to, to help people get out stories. One of the things we're doing, which I'd love to have you guys think about, is that um, our first kind of big run on the app is gonna be at Thanksgiving, where we are gonna ask every um, US history teacher in the country to assign their students to record a grandparent or another elder, so that theoretically over Thanksgiving weekend, we can record a whole generation of Americans and honor them in this way. And anything that you all can do, well, thank you. A anything that you can do to help us get the word out and anything we can do to work with you guys, we'd, we'd love to do it. Um, you know, I, I, I think about, I was thinking, I grabbed, um, I don't know, I, when I grew up, my grandmother was very into theater. I had a crazy grandmother. Uh, she was an advice columnist for the Post and she had a sister, my Aunt Bertie, who insisted she invented fruit salad and would always say, <laughs> I mean, but they loved theater. And I went, I mean, I saw like Fiddler on the Roof, I went like, 20 times when I was a kid, she took me over and over and over and over again. And I think about moments like, um, like seeing a Carolyn or change um, and um, uh, just that feeling of elation and connection and, and um, you know, again, like it's just when, 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 when we're hitting our mark and when you guys are hitting your mark, which you do so often, that feeling of connection with the universe you know, great art, you know, and, um, you know, I think that, that um, what, what we try and do at StoryCorps is kind of remind people, uh, like, that every life matters, you know, equally and infinitely, and as I said before, how lucky we are to be alive, and, um, and that's, you know, what happens to your audiences night in and night out when they come in and see, you know, a work of, of art, a work of beauty, uh, and the service you're doing is so unbelievably important, and I know you know, um, we're all in the nonprofit business. Everybody here is not, they're, they're known for profits, right? This is all nonprofit, no for profit people, okay. Fuck them. <laughs> um, and I know that, I know that the work, um, you know, it's like, it's, uh, it's, it's so hard and sometimes it's like a grind and you're like a fighter and you get punched and you just have to get up off the ground and keep fighting. You know, I, I um, there was a per someone who left StoryCorps, it wasn't uh, Meredith, but someone else who left, who when he gave his speech, he said, you know, this is, this is, um, this is blood work, you know, this is love work, this is hard work, and that's what you guys do, and I know how hard it can be, but you just gotta keep pulling yourselves off the mat and fighting another day to bring art and beauty to people, because, you know, that's what it's all about, that's why we're alive. I'm gonna play one more um, story about someone who, uh, who fought hard for something uh, that he believed in. And, um, and then I'm gonna be signing books out there for a few minutes and then back on a plane. Um, so um, thank you all, thank you for what you do. Go easy on it tonight. Um, and, 
and uh, it's, it's been an honor to, to be here. This is, we've started doing animations. I don't know if any of you have seen them. They're really fun. Oh, and subscribe to our podcast, which is, is pretty great, and use the app. But more importantly than that, like do an interview with a loved one, you know, using the app, not using the app. Uh, as I said with my dad, like you're going to find out things that you never knew about that person and you will never regret it. It's such an incredible and important experience. Um, and this is, this is a story for story again that speaks to what happens when we have an archive this big. This was on the anniversary of the Challenger shuttle and we went into our archive at the 25th anniversary to see if anybody who had been involved in the shuttle disaster had come to StoryCorps. And it turned out that one of the, the brother of one of the astronauts had come to StoryCorps and this is his story. he was nine years old, Ron, without my parents or myself knowing his whereabouts, he decided to take a mile walk from our home down to the library, which was, of course, public library, but not so public for black folks okay. when you're talking about 1959. So as he was walking in there, all these folks were staring at him because they were white folk only, and they were looking at him and said, well, you know, who's this Negro? <laughs> so he politely positioned himself in line to check out his books. Well, this old librarian, she says, this library is not for coloreds. He said, well, I would like to check out these books. She says, young man, if you don't leave this library right now, I'm going to call the police. So he just propped himself up on the counter <laughs> and, <laughs> and sat there and said, I'll wait. So she called the police and subsequently called my mother. The police came down, two burly guys come in and say, well, where's the disturbance? And she pointed to the little nine-year-old boy sitting up on the counter. He says, man, what's the problem? <laughs> so my mother, in the meanwhile, she was called. She comes down there praying the whole way there. Lord, Jesus, please don't let them put my child in jail. And my mother asked the librarian, what's the problem? If you want to check out the books, and you know your son shouldn't be down here. Uh, and the police officer said, you know, why don't you just give the kid the books? And my mother said, he'll take good care of them. And reluctantly, the librarian gave Ron the books. And, and my mother said, what do you say? He said, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> Later on, as youngsters, a show came on TV called Star Trek. Now, Star Trek showed the future where there were black folk and white folk working together. Right. And I looked at it as science fiction, because that wasn't going to happen, really. <laughs> but Ronald saw it as science possibility. Mm -hmm. You know, he came up during a time when there was Neil Armstrong and all of those guys. So how was a, a colored boy from South Carolina wearing glasses, never flew a plane, how was he going to become an astronaut? But Ron was the one who didn't accept societal norms as being his norm, and that was for other people. And um, he got to be aboard his own Starship Enterprise. <laughs> So thank you, thank you all, each and every one of you. Thank you for, for what you do. It matters deeply to all of us. It matters very, very deeply. Keep on, never give up. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, thank you, Dave, for sharing those stories with us. I think we're all getting a little choked up, and um, thanks for all that StoryCorps is doing. You've inspired me to tell, uh, to go record a story of my dad, who's watching on live stream. Hi, Dad. <laughs> so, we've got more for you today. It's not over. Uh, we're heading into our next round of professional affinity groups, and then diner rounds, and performances, and ending the night with the late night party.
If that sounds like a lot, don't worry, because tomorrow morning there's going to be a donut truck. <laughs> I'll say that again. <laughs> There'll be a donut truck tomorrow morning. So have a wonderful night, because you know in the morning we're going to take care of you. Have fun, y'all. Thank you.